to push people toward imagining what they never imagined and feeling what they've never felt before. an old friend of all of ours, so I'd like you all to welcome uh, Timothy Leary. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, for one, am overjoyed to be here. Uh, this is one of those special, special evenings that we will all treasure. Terrence McKenna means a great deal to me. Uh, I would say he's one of the five or six most important people on the planet. I can't even think of any others. Uh, <laughs> short term memory loss, but. <laughs> um, Terrence and I keep meeting in the most wonderful, mythic, adventurous uh, places. Uh, I was doing a, a wild tour through Germany about so a year ago. We came to Heidelberg and we were uh, being guested by some people that came right out of Hermann Hesse. I mean, wizards and gnomes and, uh, you know, that sort of thing, Heidelberg. And uh, there was Terrence McKenna and it was just... It was just so perfectly Hesse, journey to the east, yeah. Uh, um, and uh, so we meet again here tonight. Uh, you know, uh, I was talking to Terrence uh, backstage before uh, we began, and we, we both agree that uh, what he will be saying tonight has been said over and over again at all those high moments in human history when those who have gone within and understood about the brain and the inner inner uh, treasures, uh, we all come back and pretty much say the same thing. The, the problem is though that once you say it, uh, you know, the, you can't go on saying it and saying it and saying it. Uh, and when Terrence came along a few years ago and was saying what I'd been trying to say, but naturally better, upgraded, uh, up to date, I was so overwhelmed with gratitude and I publicly thank you for that, uh, Terrence. By the way, the role that Terrence is playing right now is one that takes not only vision, but it also takes fucking courage. Uh, we were saying backstage that, that Terrence and I are a small group of philosophers who make our living not in the ivory tower, uh, if you call it living, but uh, uh, just speaking it chanting it, raving it, uh, ranting it, uh, and uh, no one has ever done it with more, uh, with more poetry and elegance than uh, the speaker tonight. Uh, I'm going to say one more thing and then uh, we will have what we've all been waiting for. Terence reminds us that uh, all human wisdom, all energy uh, comes from our beloved synergetic partners, the vegetable queendom. It all comes from the plants. Now, round of applause <laughs> to the vegetables. Now, we all know that the human body, uh, we have to have food. It comes from vegetables. Uh, we have used vegetables over the years, the essence of vegetables in the form of wood to, to develop fire, gas, oil, and so forth. But what, what we forget and what uh, we look Terence for tonight is to be reminded that plants have given us an even more important gift. They give us the gift of vision. They give us the illumination. And throughout human history, there are the Eves and the Pandoras. Usually it's a, it's a woman 
who takes this wonderful vegetable and gives it to humanity and says, uh, be illuminated. And now, for our illumination and our, our pleasure, uh, please join me in welcoming Terence McKenna. Well, I want to thank Tim. That was a wonderful introduction. I'm sure I wouldn't, I know I wouldn't be here tonight if it weren't for Tim Leary. He was the pathfinder. He cut the way through the woods. He gave us all permission to be very much the people that we are tonight. And uh, it's wonderful that one Irishman can hand it on to another and that we can keep it uh, in the bardic tradition. I can hardly believe I'm here. I made it past the Camaro raffle. I survived the offer for reconstructive cosmetic surgery. <laughs> and I've had my smart drugs for this evening. So, uh, glad to be here. Well, until a few minutes ago, I thought that this was a 45-minute gig, so um, <clears throat> you get to see Grace under pressure this evening. Actually, I'm kidding. It doesn't matter how long it goes. Uh, we could never get to the bottom of this stuff. Uh, nor would we wish to, uh, I think. By coincidence, merely, um, I became 45 yesterday. <laughs> so, <laughs> sort of a good uh, moment to do some summing up. So in thinking about this talk and knowing as I did who would be here, I thought that uh, I would sort of orient the theme toward distilling the psychedelic mind which is uh, a way of talking about the psychedelic mind, but also trying to, uh, considering the amount of money you paid for this session, give you the entire shtick in one fell swoop, uh, so that you would never have to attend a Terence McKenna <laughs> lecture or workshop again. You could just move past that. Uh, Turn the page on that kind of thing in your life. Uh... With me in the studio is Terence McKenna, author, lecturer, explorer, and philosopher. Terence is the co-author with his brother Dennis McKenna of a book called The Invisible Landscape, Mind, Hallucinogens, and the I Ching. He's also the co-author of Psilocybin, Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide. He is the author of a computer program called Time Wave Zero, and he's the co-founder and president of an organization called Botanical Dimensions, which devotes itself to saving botanical plants used in shamanistic traditions throughout the world. Welcome, Terence. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. Well, I think the most profound cultural development is it is possible to make the case that language itself is an ability that was coaxed out of a, an evolving primate species by virtue of the fact that there were hallucinogenic plants in the diet of that creature. You see, psilocybin has been shown in low doses to actually increase visual acuity. Well, at the stage of evolution where uh, human beings encountered psilocybin mushrooms, we were essentially baboon-like, pack-hunting hordes of veldt-living creatures in Africa. In that situation, a compound which increases visual acuity 
will give a tremendous adaptive advantage to the animals that are including it in their diet. And those animals not including it in their diet will be quickly eliminated by the process of natural selection from the evolutionary scenario. So it's possible to argue that this mind manifesting quality of the psychedelics actually conferred an evolutionary uh, advantage on certain primates who then were able to bootstrap themselves to higher and higher states of reflective self-awareness. This may lie behind the very early coincidence of cattle, goddesses, and mushrooms in the apparent obsessions of early man as reflected by the cave paintings on the Algerian plateau and in southern France and Spain. We always find the notion of the mystery <coughs> circa 18,000 years ago connected with the idea of cattle and we always find the cattle connected with the notion of the great goddess. Now it may be that the hidden and third member of this trinity was a hallucinogenic mushroom of some mm -hmm. sort. We've got only about two minutes left, but I, I wonder what the connection, I don't, I don't quite see it between the mushroom, the cattle, and the goddess. The mushrooms grow in the manure of the cattle. When the hunting packs of early primates followed along behind the cattle, they inevitably encountered the mushroom, ate it, had their visual skills thereby increased, bred more readily, therefore, and survived more easily than their non-mushroom-eating cousins. And so the eating of mushrooms and the development of higher aspects of consciousness, including self-reflection, were thereby enforced leading to the conclusion that it was actually a symbiotic relationship between early primates and these hallucinogenic plants that laid the basis for the appearance of what we call human beings. Mm -hmm. Well, Terence McKenna, this is a very interesting discussion. You seem to be suggesting that our evolution, I suppose, from the animal kingdom into the human kingdom itself was catalyzed or, or triggered by our encounter with these hallucinogenics. And Yes, we are an ape with a symbiotic relationship to a mushroom, and that has given us mm -hmm. self-reflection, language, religion, and all the spectrum of effects that flow from mm -hmm. these things. Yeah, and one can only wonder how these hallucinogens might affect our future evolution as well. They have brought us to this point, and as we make our relationship to them conscious, we may be able to take control of our future mm -hmm. evolutionary mm -hmm. path. In the 120 years from 1500 to the beginning of the Thirty Years' War, Europe was caught in a number of conspiracies and political intrigues directed toward moving Europe toward a magical and alchemically based society. Uh, the Protestant princes of the Northern League of Germany, especially Frederick the Elector Palatine, came to culminate this movement, but its roots lie further back in the 1580s of the 16th century. It was in this period that the English astrologer, astronomer, mathematician, navigator, and expert of espionage, John Dee, launched his famous and mysterious mission to Bohemia, a little-known incident in European history which holds clues to understanding the fate and evolution of modern science and the nature of a lost world of magical and alchemical thinking that once claimed the attention of the European imagination. John Dee, the greatest mind of the Elizabethan era, friend of Queen Elizabeth, colleague of Sir Philip Sidney, Converser with angels, mathematician par excellence, determined under the influence of the mysterious Edward Kelly that he was to be the center 
of an alchemical renaissance and a secret society that would lay the groundwork for the continuation of the dream of Astraea, the dream built around the Elizabethan queen, Elizabeth I. He associated himself intensely with the Arthurian mythical and mystical side of the Elizabethan idea of British Empire. He was a Welshman, like the Queen he was so intensely devoted to, and like her he shared the Renaissance mood of Saturnian melancholy, a collector of books, a builder of scientific instruments, a composer of codes and ciphers, fascinated with alchemy. Dee was both the figure of the introspective melancholic and the world-planning, empire-building political visionary. Dee was under the patronage of the Earl of Northumberland and it was Northumberland who looted the Catholic monasteries at the time of Henry VIII. We have reason to believe that John Dee had virtual carte blanche in selecting manuscripts from those libraries that interested him. Not only was Dee a scholar of the classics and the magical past, but he was an intimate friend with some of the great movers and shakers of his own time, particularly Sir Philip Sidney and the entire coterie of poets and artists who had gathered themselves around Elizabeth, Astraea, to celebrate her reign and to make of her the paradigmatic sovereign of Europe that Dee believed led the way toward the establishing of a universal alchemical monarchy. It was essentially a poetic enterprise, as alchemy always is. Uh, Merlin, in the Arthurian legends, has come down to us basically disguised as John Dee. The image we have of Merlin is Dee's image. Uh, so, Dee possessed an enormous uh, power over the imagination of his contemporaries. They were in awe of his learning. Perhaps we are the naive ones. Perhaps we too quickly assume that we had understood all there was to know about matter. After all, even to this moment, we cannot locate the seat of the imagination in matter. We cannot trace the evolution of a human thought or hope in matter. It's almost as though the alchemists, through their humility, had a deeper insight into the workings of the world than we have achieved today. This is ground zero for the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. Standing here in the alchemical laboratory of the palace in Heidelberg, we are essentially at the center of the alchemical hopes of the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. It was here in the years before the adventure in Bohemia that Frederick's alchemists, astrologers, and soothsayers toiled directly under the king's observation and control. Here came Michael Meyer, Heinrich Kundrath, the great names of alchemy. It's entirely possible that John Dee was in this room. It's entirely possible that Edward Kelly stood where I am standing now.
It's almost impossible to conceive of the hopes and the fantasies and the labors and the dreams that have been generated by and are centered on this room and the objects in it. This is the last alchemical laboratory in the world to fully function before the rise of modern science. And these tools in many ways reflect the internal cosmology of the men and women who use them. This, for example, a typical alchemical distillery is called the pelican. Another example of the colorful nature of alchemical vocabulary. It's called the pelican because it is associated with the myth of a bird which plucks blood from its own breast. The prima materia, feces, black coal, charcoal, salt nitre, heated in here, brought to a high temperature, a fevered caloric state, rises into the higher imperium of the vessel, and there, rarefied, it condenses, liquefies, and flows down into the cooler domain of the child of the pelican. Here the essence is collected, the quintessence, and always the hope was that the next experiment, the next combination of materials would yield the elixir vitae, the lapis philosophorum, the completion that the alchemist sought. And so all this fantastic apparatus that we see around us is really not so much in the service of channeling liquids, gases, but in the service of channeling spirit out of matter and into the higher realms where it then can be refluxed, recondensed, and the lapis philosophorum, the stone of the philosophers, the central mystery brought to completion. The transformation of matter into a universal panacea for the redemption of mankind. This was Dee's great passion this was the overarching theme of his life, a deep, deep commitment to the reformation of society and a deep, deep uh, exhaustion and rejection of the values of Christendom that he saw betrayed all about him. And then by distillation, and then by coagulation, and then by concentration through firing, the alchemical body is brought to completion. These are processes that go on both within the chemical retort, the alembic, in the alchemist's laboratory, and they are processes which go on in the heart and mind of the alchemist. One process dissolves. Another process separates the dross, the gross matter, from the precious. Another concentrates the subtle essence. Another raises the subtle essence to another level of refinement. And over time, the great friend of the alchemist. This process of rarefaction and growth, both metallic and psychological, both internal and external, uh, both personal and impersonal, proceeds and feeds upon itself, and eventually, not through any logic discernible to the scientific mind, there is a kind of miracle, the production of the stone, the union of spirit and matter, the fusion of these two contradictory aspects of the universe into a new and third thing, 
the quintessence, the rubedo, the lapis philosophorum, the aqua vitae, the nostre lapis philosophorum vivici. One of the most famous of all alchemical axioms is as above, so below, meaning always that in every small part of reality there is a tiny reflection of the great overstructure of reality and in the largest structures are hidden the secrets of the smallest and vice versa. We have unconsciously imbibed the ontology of science where we have mind firmly separated out from the world. But in an earlier age, mind and matter were seen to be alloyed together throughout nature. And I think it's very interesting that at this very high-tech moment in our adventure, the plants return and almost stand before us as a, a beacon and a promise. They stand for absolute Tao. They stand for the correct way for life to relate to its environment. This is one of the most interesting new psychedelics in the world. This is Salvia divinorum, and uh, it is definitely one of the plants which will shape the next few decades of the new millennium. This is a coleus. It's ironic that these plants, which have been in our kitchens and in our windowsill flower beds for generations, turn out to contain psychoactive compounds as powerful as any known to science. These are not particularly interesting in terms of drugs, but they're certainly bizarre. I'm up here with me. This is one of the most interesting plants in the garden. This is Cicotria viridis. This is the plant which causes the vision. When taken with ayahuasca, when taken as a liquid, the experience lasts about four to six hours. It's not as intense as smoking it. Smoking it is the most intense experience, this side of the yawning grave. When I take psychedelics, I always do it in a shamanic style usually at night, usually alone, in nature if possible, and then I watch. I pay very close attention. I use my mind as an alchemical vessel for carrying out observations on the union of spirit, my spirit, my personality, and matter, the physical matter of the substance that I'm ingesting. Building on Western psychotherapy as elaborated by Freud and Jung, one view of what psychedelics are is it's the part of your mind that you'd rather not do business with. It's the memories of childhood neglect or abuse. It's uh, repressed kinky fantasies. It's, in other words, the, uh, the Freudian idea of the unconscious, that somehow these are drugs which dissolve the boundary between conscious and unconscious mind, and then you can do accelerated psychotherapy, because resistances have been pharmacologically overcome. That's one model. It's good as far as it goes. It just doesn't go far enough. Then there's another model, which I would call the traditional 
or shamanic model. And it says uh, the cosmos is a series of levels. And these levels are connected by um, um, vertical routes of access, which can be thought of as simply flights through space, or magical trees, or magical ladders. Anyway, there's an, an image of ascent. And ordinary people exist on only one of these levels. But a shaman is not an ordinary person. A shaman is a superhuman person who has the power of animal allies behind them. And they can go up and down in these elevators that move between levels and they can therefore recover lost souls, see uh, social hanky-panky, theft and adultery, see the causes behind that, see the causes behind disease, so forth and so on. That would be the traditional one. Well, thinking about this from a mathematician's point of view, a, a, an all-encompassing explanation that would explain how all these magical feats are done is simply to suppose that the shaman is somehow able to project his consciousness, his or her consciousness, into a higher dimension. Not metaphorically, as in Sylvester Stallone has many dimensions, not metaphorically, but literally, as in one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions, and four. And I have noticed that all of biology, not simply shamanism within the context of human society, but all of biology is, in a sense, a conquest of dimensionality that as we ascend the phylogeny of organic life, what animals are, are a strategy for conquering space-time. And complex animals do it better than simpler animals. And we do it better than any complex animal. And we 20th century people do it better than any people in any previous century because we can bind data in so many ways that they couldn't electronically, on film, on tape, so forth and so on. because what it, culture provides is a bunch of rules, so you don't have to think, and a bunch of myths, so you don't have to think again. The culture has all the answers, you know. You wanna know where people came from? Well, when the sky god got out of his canoe at first waterfall and took a leak, then we, the true people, appeared like ants, and we've been living here any, ever since. Oh, huh. gee, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I'm glad I asked. Uh, you know, this is what culture does for you. So, but now technology throws a curve. And the curve is that we live so long that we figure out what a scam this is. We figure out that what you're supposed to work for isn't worth having. We figure out that our politicians are buffoons. We figure out that professional scientists are reputation-building, grab-tailing weasels. We discover that all organizations are corrupted by ambition. Uh, you know, you get the picture. We figure it out. Well, then, as intellectuals, and anybody who figures it out is an intellectual, believe me, because they're slinging the programming to push you the other way. Uh, so then intellectuals, defined as people who figure it out, uh, discover that you are alienated. That's what figuring it out means. It means you understand that the BMW, the Harvard degree, the whatever it is, that this is all baloney and manipulated and hyped and that 
most of you have a bunch of clueless people who are figuring out which fork they should use. Uh, culture, and this is my message to artists and to anybody else who cares to notice, culture is a plot against the expansion of consciousness. And this plot prosecutes its, uh, its goals through a uh, limiting of language. Language is the battleground over which the, the fight will take place because what we cannot, what we cannot say we cannot communicate, and by say, I mean dance, paint, sing, meme. What we cannot say, we cannot communicate. We can conceive of things that we cannot communicate. But, and I think every one of us here has done that, and that's a thrilling thing. That is uh, the deep homework. The, the psychedelic inner astronaut sees things which no human being has ever seen before and no human being will ever see again. But in fact, this has no meaning unless it is possible to carry it back into the collectivity. Well, the only way out of this, I think, is to, um, it takes courage, because you have to turn your back on your culture in the most profound sense there is, because there are many ways to turn your back on your culture. I mean, if everyone's wearing gray, you can wear green. That's one way to turn your back on a culture. But another way is to break its laws. Now that's a little more serious and you know brings in big philosophical issues. But in fact, the culture is an enormous arrow pointing, go this way. And you know what lies that way? Impoverishment, madness, degradation, and death. That's where the culture is pointing. You can see it. You can see it, just look where we're headed. Uh, uh, if everyone on earth aspires to the kind of lifestyle that you people can enjoy by virtue of having paid the money to be at a scene like this, there isn't enough glass, metal, and plastic in the planet to make that many celicas and uh, jaguars and bluebirds and snowbirds and all the rest of this crap. So what is needed is uh, an awakening. me at about the hour and 20 minute mark, give or take not more than five minutes, it begins what's called streaming. Streaming is when you close your eyes and there are after image colored globs of stuff floating by, either colored mauve or chartreuse. It's pretty trivial. And, but you just watch. And part of what you have to train people to do is it's weird. People don't know how to look at the back of their own eyelids. People don't know how to look at darkness. And so what I say is close your eyes, sit in darkness, and watch the back of your eyelids with the simple expectation that you might see something. You know, close your eyes and look. Well then the streaming gives way to the, the first wave, which is usually pretty steep. I mean, I've had trips where I could see it coming toward me, you know, and it was a hundred miles wide and ten miles high, and it's just like a tidal wave, and you say, oh my God, you know, what have we done here? <laughs> Raise this thing up, and it's just roaring toward you, and there's nothing you can do then, except I just say to it, you know, I'm yours, please don't hurt me. Please, for Christ's sake, don't hurt me. And uh, it, 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 it's like watching a thermonuclear explosion through a 
about 30 feet of crystal clear glass. I mean, when I do it in California, I have the feeling that when the thing hits, everybody from Vancouver to Tijuana must have just had to crawl under their desk because the idea that this is in your mind is inconceivable. I mean, it hits with the force of an asteroid impact or something like that. And finally, you know, in a sense, you lose consciousness because you, you, you can't say what goes on. It's just so extraordinarily boundary dissolving that there's no there there and there's no you there to tell you about it. And then you begin to drift down through the layers and it presents itself. And it can present itself all kinds of different ways. I, I remember one trip I had, I think it was this same trip, the 100 miles wide, 10 miles high thing, this wave came at me and I barely had time to lay down. And after a long, long time, I became aware that there was a woman standing over me in some kind of tight-fitting suit, some kind of sexy outfit, and, uh, and I heard a voice and it said, uh, they say it helps to close your eyes, cowboy. <laughs> and so I closed my eyes. And, uh, and, 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 it was just, and it was just raging. And then after about 30 seconds, I opened my eyes. And this woman who, had her, who was standing over me with my body between her legs, put her face right down next to mine and said, is it strong enough for you, asshole? <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. 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 <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the humor of the thing is amazing. The, it, it can come at you so many different ways. Uh, and, and then the conversations take place. And they can be anything. The other thing you can do with mushrooms, which is, which is really fun, is you can say to it, uh, be MDMA. And it will just drop its outer space-ish garb and, and all that, and it will be MDMA. You can say to it, be LSD and it will be LSD. And then, as I said, the scariest thing to say to it is, show me what you really are for yourself. And at that point, it, it, just, it just begins to come apart, and you can't stand it. After 40 seconds of that, you say, I'm sorry I even asked. <laughs> you know, reassure me. And because you have a sense, you know, my God, this thing is what it seems to be. It's a galactic intelligence. It's a billion years old. It's touched 10 million worlds. It knows the history of 150,000 civilizations. It's beyond your possibility of conceiving and how, why it is communicating with an, an organic atom like yourself is not entirely clear. You know, when psychedelics were first being discussed, it was thought that they would prepare people for death. In a sense, they probably do. But in the same way that they prepare people for death, they prepare people for transformation. It gets you used to the idea that the world is not what it appears to be. And it gets you used to the idea that the world is somehow animate, intelligent, and proceeding along its own agenda. So in a way, shamans have always been anticipations of some future state of mankind. They're the masters of language. They are the ones who are telepathic with the animals. They are the ones who can see into the future. So this archaic nostalgia gets real focus once you realize that it is the shaman and his or her shamanic techniques that confers on them uh, the extra historical dimension. That that is how you get out 
of linear history. That's how you visit the realm of the ancestors. That's how you travel into the future. That's how you break up the tyranny of Newtonian serial time. The Gaian mind has always been there. Nature originally through the plants and shamanism provided the tools for us to access this incredible natural database. Through the vicissitudes of history, previous generations lost the key in Western society. Since the 1960s, the key has been refound. It's a matter of great social controversy. It's a matter of, uh, of, of great risk to those who take it, how they will be viewed by their peers. But there is no longer, uh, ignorance is no longer an excuse. Anthropology in the last hundred years has laid at our doorstep the tools necessary for an archaic reconstruction of uh, society and uh, human values within that society. It's inconceivable that Western industrial capitalism could run on another 500 or 1,000 years. Uh, it, it will not continue as it has. It will deteriorate under the pressure of resource scarcity. And what few democratic values we have obtained, what little space for reasoned discourse has been created, will be the first to be swept away. So it's, it's very, very important that people take back their minds and that people analyze our dilemma in the context of the entire human story from the descent onto the grassland to our potential destiny as citizens of the galaxy and the universe. We are at a critical turning point. And as I say, the tools, the, the data that is, holds the potential for our salvation is now known. It is available. It is among us. But it is misrepresented. It is slandered, it is litigated against, and uh, it's up to each one of us to relate to this situation in a fashion that will allow us to answer the question that will surely be put to us in some point in the future, which is, what did you do to help save the world? History is some kind of a phase transition. It only lasts about 25,000 years. Some people think that's a long time. Some people think it's a short time. It depends on where you stand. I think of it as snap, you know? One moment you're hunting uh, ungulates on the plains of Africa, and the next moment you're hurling a gold deterbium super conducting extra stellar device toward Alpha Centauri with all of mankind aboard in virtual space being run as a simulation in circuitry. <laughs> you know? It's just first the one thing, then the other thing. Uh, but now history, which lasts 25,000 years, is this weird period where you're neither fish nor fowl. You know, you're not the hunting ape anymore, but you are not yet the 16-dimensional digital god, you know? And, and in that transition phase, there is confusion, there is uh, angst. But now we're at the end. We have no, I, I maintain anybody who's peddling angst and peddling pessimism and peddling all this stuff is just that so two minutes ago. <laughs> Question. It's a 
very, very mysterious. I guess I should try and describe this. You are the people to tell, if anybody is. What I found about this communicating with it thing is that、um, sometimes it's easy and it just comes, and that's what the trip is about. But if it's elusive for you, or if you've taken mushrooms many times and yet this doesn't seem to be what happened to you, I can describe how it works for me anyway. It's as though a certain level of intoxication with the mushroom is the precondition for being able to communicate, but is not itself enough. So that I will be, I will feel the levels building in my body, and I will be very stoned, and then I will come into this place where I will say, "Now it is possible to invoke the spirit." In the mushroom, and then I invoke it, and、uh, it, it's a pretty straightforward thing. I remember an old "I Love Lucy" thing where Ethel is asking Lucy how she gets in touch with the flying saucers, and she says, "I just say, 'Come in, little green man, come in, little green man.'" <laughs> it's almost like that. In fact, it is like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not green. What I do is I get the feeling, which is I call it.、Um, it's almost like I'm embarrassed to tell this kind of stuff. It it it's a feeling of being very Irish. It's a feeling of elfinness. And then I say, "Aha! We're getting close in. They're near. I smell them. They're nearby." And then I just say, you know, show, 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 and there's this music, this tinkling stuff, and it begins to get stronger. So I say, you know, come in, little green man, come in, and then it, it gets louder and louder, and then finally, once you get the valve open, you don't have to worry; it will pour through as long as you can watch it and be with it. And sing with it, and it is obviously the basis for the idea of elves and elfin energy and little people who make jeweled machines and play musical instruments and live in the mountains. I've wondered these same things, asked it what it is. It seems to be able to present itself many different ways. I mean, it can be almost like a robotic, cybernetic, disembodied kind of thing, or sometimes it's like, you know, your girlfriend in hyperspace. It has this very sexy kind of.、Uh, I don't know these funny vibes to be coming off a pharmaceutical product,、uh, <laughs> and but it might as well be another intellect because it seems like it. It seems as different from you as the person sitting next to you. At least that different from you. So I treat it that way. I don't know. You know, perhaps people have always heard voices in states of high、uh, agitation or stimulation. We don't know what to do with that kind of thing because it's not in our tradition. But it's a shocking reality. I mean, for anybody who thinks plants don't talk, it's a real life reorienting experience to have one then harangue you. And、uh, I didn't think. Plants talked. I didn't. I had friends who claimed this, and I, my dream was really to reach to figure out what these people could possibly mean. It seems to be truly a visual communicator. Its mode is vision. It shows you what it intends. But the mushroom, actually. Speaks. It delivers itself of little aphorisms.、Uh, 
you know, I'm sure you've heard me try to sum them up for people. I mean, it's said things to me like, uh, man must have a plan. If you don't have a plan, you'll become part of somebody else's plan. It's said, um, nature loves courage. The way nature responds to courage is by removing obstacles. Well, these are things that your middle track Zen guru could probably come up with. But then it says other things which are completely puzzling. It says things like, uh, what you call man is time. And then sometimes it, it, you know, it is humorous. I mean, hilariously, insanely humorous. It's like having Groucho Marx in bed with you. I mean, so sometimes it, it has a certain Rod Steiger-esque kind of uh, Jewish persona. I remember one conversation I had with it where I was said, what are you doing here? And it said, listen, you're a mushroom, you live cheap. <laughs> In the Jugendstil splendor of one of Prague's most famous concert halls, we encountered Richard Alpert and persuaded him to have lunch with us. Alpert, who now calls himself Ram Das, is one of the most enduring figures from the American cultural upheaval of the 1960s. Alpert, whose career reaches from Harvard University to the plains of the Punjab, has transformed himself into a spokesman for humanities ignored and downtrodden. Well, when you, when you look, you mentioned in your talk the other night, since some people think the 90s are going to be a second turn of the spiral, I observed the 60s as a spear-carrying 14-year-old. I was down in the masses. What were the mistakes that are avoidable? than if there's a second chance. They're inevitably going to be avoided. The first mistake was idealism. The first mistake, and the mistake was thinking that because you had seen it, you could just go like that and everybody else would see it. And you could just say, it's all love, and then everybody would love. I mean, that was, it was a naivete. It was naivete. It was not working on ourselves deeply enough to be without the clinging of mind that made us try to use it. It's, it's, it was our lurking righteousness that got in our way. Can you make a revolution, though, without an inner righteousness? That's exactly, that's the far out question of where would the action come from? And there's this line in Buddhism that says, out of emptiness arises compassion. And what I experience is, that there is a way in which I can sit down in front of a truck or feed a person or go make love or go surf and there is an appropriateness in every one of those acts and for me to hear that I've really got to shut up and my, uh, my work is to keep shutting up to hear which one it is and if it is a revolution it's a rev so be it mm -hmm. so be it you know the story of the, of the monk and the uh, army general? You know, and the army general's disemboweling all the monks? Tell and me. his reputation has spread far and wide. He's a cruel, cruel man. And he comes into this village and he says to his adjutant, tell me what's happening. And the adjutant said, all the people are frightened. They're bowing down to you. All the monks in the monastery have fled to the hills but one monk. And the general was outraged about this one monk. And he gets up and he goes to the monastery and he pushes open the doors of the monastery and he walks into the courtyard and there's the monk standing in the middle of the courtyard and he walks up to him and he says, don't you know who I am? I could take my sword and run it through your belly without blinking an eye. And don't you know who I am? I could have your sword run through my belly without blinking an eye. That's great. That's the place from which revolutions can, can heal, rather than just starting the cycle all over again. Then this is the place we never found in the 60s.
Mm-mm. I mean, I've always no. said we, it was no. all we well and good. We reduced it to revolution, rather, and although we had the taste of evolution, we reduced it to revolution. Well, in the day they came with machine guns, we didn't stand like that monk. Everybody said, well, my God, you could get killed playing this game. And I flew to Laos and India for three years. But already we had produced the they by being so busy being we. True. Because so that they even noticed we. The fact that they noticed us was because we were busy being, we were busy making statements instead of just being it. So maybe, I mean, this is just occurring to me, that being in a place like Prague, the real thing we have to learn here is how to make velvet revolutions. Exactly. exactly right. Exactly right. That's why I admire Havel so much. That's why he's way up there in my because he's 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 he is a compassionate leader. He's got wisdom, not just knowledge. He is tuned. There's a, there's a quality of his heart that feels present. And he said in this op-ed article I just read his letter last month. Uh, I read it too. And yeah. you know, he, at one point he said. Uh, so we have to allow the naturalness to come back, the personal stuff, the heart stuff. I mean, he was right there with all of the... Do you see, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I don't, let me preface it by saying, do you see anybody who could play that role for the millions of kids in England and the United States who are now asking, where do we go from here? good or bad? I guess the situation hasn't demanded the emergence of that being it. Of those kinds of Because it can't be anybody that comes forward and says, I'm it. Oh, no. It has no. to be someone who the people But the situation say, You're can it. demand the formation. I mean, you, you watch, does, does, the, does the man make the time or does the time make the man? You know, and you can feel how what took a certain person 20 years like to ride a bicycle somebody later on can ride a bicycle like that because the whole culture rides bicycles there's some like uh, process where it, the situation emerges where the person has to come forward and they're just forced out i mean i go and i look at all the senators that are running for this or that and i go to breakfast with them and i listen and i tune and jerry brown i hung out with and i said you know he's got interesting ideas but as a his heart my god he's got work to do this poor guy he's suffering so much and and i just keep i love him and i want those ideas out but i want him to work on himself you know and uh, so but i don't do see you really else. care in terms of political terms whether jerry brown makes himself palatable to an electorate i care because i work with the mayan widows in guatemala and i feel like i'm representing them and our our government our administration's policies are killing them and their children and their husbands. And some way, I've got to play my part as a member of a society that is imposing so much suffering on so many people. I can't just walk away and say, oh, I'm helping the nice Mayans. I've also got to realize I'm an American citizen that's hurting the Mayans, and I've got to play both games to change one, one way and to do the other thing. So <clears throat> there's a kind of, um, not to go egghead here, but a kind of coincidencia positorum, because on one level what you're saying is, it's all right, don't worry. And on another level, you clearly are involved in a search for defining your role, your where you would do some good. Optimum judo move. Optimum judo, judo move. move. So it isn't Awaken enough to just say the system. the system will take care of itself. But I am part of the system, but it's taking care of itself. So you it's a sense I'm of acting without of acting through self. It's being not identified with the actor and not being identified with the fruits of the action. That's, I mean, to me, the, my, one of my basic texts is the Bhagavad Gita, and those are the two injunctions. Mm -hmm. And I really hear those. And they're very weird. How you do an act when you're not identified with being the actor and you're not attached to fruit. I mean, you... I've, I leave this, this funny, continuous paradox that suffering stinks and suffering's grace. And I live with both of those all the time. Well, I don't, I think most people do. Don't you I think? think most people have made a, taken a position. Oh, that suffering is bad, they hate it, they want or, to keep yeah, it away from it. Or that it's grace, that it's, you know, lovely. 
Well, and then the great masses of people never really draw the distinction because no. for them suffering is like air and water. It's life. It, it's life. It comes with it's it. life. Yeah. Burying yeah. the many children you bear. That's and... why I found in the villages in India less suffering than I found around the middle class in America. Certainly less whining. Yeah, well, less preoccupation with their with what they don't have. Well, they have a philosophy of reincarnation that must sustain them. There is something else that's feeding them. Where we have a philosophy of, you know, if you don't get it now, no, you, you never, never will. <clears throat> exactly. We threw out in the councils of Nicaea, Trent, and Constantinople just the thing that would have healed. But we did it so that the church could have power over it. Well, I think it was Friedrich Nietzsche who said there was only one Christian and they crucified him. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, God, that's so <laughs> good. That's such a good line. <laughs> well, my, you know, I was asking you what did we do wrong in the 60s. Yeah, okay. One thing that I has occurred to me, and I certainly felt it with my friends, was we assumed it would go on forever. We had no notion of window of opportunity. Yes. We just thought we'd yeah. blown the doors off yeah. the, the hinges and they would yeah. never be put back on. Yeah. To me, the most amazing transformation in my lifetime is not the revolution of the 60s, but the counter-revolution of the 70s, where they managed to put the cuckoo clock back together again, even though we'd kicked it Did all they over or the... didn't they? That's what I'm... Uh, see, you keep thinking there was that opportunity and it closed, and I think it happened then. And all of the 70s and 80s, and all that was this kind of reverberation to this process. And that I'm here, and you're here, and we're both still here since the 90s, and I got a lot of people that... Uh, you know, I talk now in middle America, and I look at my audiences, and they—they've never taken dope. They've never—they've never read a holy Eastern holy books or anything. And I just say the same stuff I was saying in the '60s that I was saying to people with flowers and big pupils. And these people in the middle—you know—they're corseted, nice people, and they're going. And I think, far out, look, it happened. And I was looking the other way. Well, that's true. And that's where you're looking for the resonance of a person to come forth that speaks from that consciousness with the assurance of the truth of it. Right. You know? Well, you know, Blake said a wonderful thing. He said, if I can get it right, if the truth can be told so as to be understood, it will be believed. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So all you have to do exactly. is say it. Exactly. When can you say it simply enough? Is it only said in silence simply enough? Or are there words? Or is there music? Or is there more? Or is there... There's words, there's music, there's silence, there's gesture. Because yeah. it, it's always going to exceed one's grasp. To this point, what I've said is could be imputed to be just talk about a superb psychedelic drug. And so they're saying, oh, well, so this guy advocates the use of a superb psychedelic drug. It seems reasonable or unreasonable, depending on where you went to church. But it, it's not that paradigm challenging. Uh, but what is paradigm challenging is the content of the experience. The content of the experience is completely uh, mind-boggling, completely befuddling. I don't know what we're going to do with the content of the experience, because fully gotten out and fully discussed and fully realized, it's not going to leave one brick upon another in the cheerfully naive edifice that our half-baked civilization has erected as universal truth. We're not going to, it's not, science is not going to be able to survive the encounter 
with the psychedelic experience. Because it is not an encounter with the Freudian, you know, the repressed memories of your miserable and battered childhood or whatever it is you went through. And it isn't even an encounter with the miserable memories of the battered childhood of the human species that we all went through, a la Carl Jung. Uh, what, that is all there. But that's in the hallway where you hang your hat and the antechamber where they take your coat. The main event, folks, doesn't even have anything to do with the psychology of human beings. The main event is another dimension. A dimension so bizarre, so titanically peculiar, so strange, so unanticipated by our language, our history, our literature, that uh, it is literally like the discovery of another world. And, and, uh, and there's life in that world. Now, a funny thing about discovering new worlds is that uh, you usually, when you get the new world all mapped out, you usually discover that there's somebody living there. And for them, it's not the new world at all. And, you know, you haven't discovered anything. You've just shown up in the middle of their scene uh, <laughs> with a distorted rap, sort of like Christopher Columbus. The first thing that happens is that there is a sense as though all the air in the room had been sucked out. All the colors brighten. This is that increase in visual acuity. All edges become sharp. Distant things stand out in their clarity. This is at one toque. At two toques. You close your eyes, you feel a sense of anesthesia seeping through your body. You close your eyes and you see a floral pattern rotating in space, usually yellow-orange. People who do this occasionally, and nobody does it a lot, call it the chrysanthemum. It's a floral pattern, like a pattern in a Chinese brocade. This forms and stabilizes, and then you either break through it or you require one more toque. So, you take, let us assume, a third toque, long and slow, through a glass pipe. You vaporize this stuff, and you take it in and in and in, and there is definitely somewhere in here a threshold a threshold which you must exceed and when you do that this membrane like thing this chrysanthemum will actually part and there is a sound uh, like the crumpling of a plastic bread wrapper or the crackling of flame a friend of mine says this is the radio intellecti of your soul exiting through the anterior fontanelle at the top of your head um, could be in any case, this crackling sound and a tone, a tone, a And then there's this impression of transition and you're now 20 seconds deep into this experience. There's an impression of transition there, it's as though there were a series of tunnels or chambers that you are tumbling down, being propelled by some kind of muscle behind you that is pushing you. I mean, yes, birth canal, yes, yes, of course. But anyway, a tunnel, and what I've noticed about this tunnel is the walls and ceiling flux and come down to meet each other, and where they touch, they pull apart with a and then you're propelled into the next space and then the next and then you are there where is there it's underground 
how you know this, you cannot say, but there is an irreconcilable sense of enormous mass surrounding you. In other words, you are underground. You're at the center of a mountain or something, and you're in a room which aficionados call the dome. And people will ask each other, did you see the dome? Were you there? And the, uh, the walls, if such they be, are crawling with geometric hallucinations, uh, very brightly colored, very iridescent with deep sheens and very high reflective surfaces. Everything is machine-like and polished and throbbing with energy. But that is not what immediately arrests my attention. What arrests my attention is the fact that this space is inhabited. That the immediate impression as you break into it is there is a cheer. You break in to this space and are immediately swarmed by squeaking, self-transforming elf machines. These things which are made of light and grammar and sound that come chirping and squealing and tumbling toward you and they say hooray welcome you're here and my uh, my immediate impression no matter how many times i do this and i've done it maybe 30 or 40 times which isn't a lot in a lifetime of worshiping it my immediate impression is that they are welcoming. Hooray! Welcome! You're here! How wonderful that you're here and you come so merrily. We're so delighted to see you. And one of the strange things about DMT is that it does not affect your mind in the ordinary sense in that, you know, drugs, they make you giggly, they frighten you, they stimulate you, they depress you. DMT does none of this. You go to that place with all your groceries. You're there, and you're there thinking, Jesus H. Fucking Christ, what is this? What is it? And there, because, and you're thinking, you know, I must be dead. I've done it this time. I, I must be dead. And so you, you know, you, you think, heart, heart, yes, mm, heart, mm, mm, mm. pulse, pulse, yes, yes. And meanwhile, these things are literally in your face. And what they do is they jump into your chest and then they jump out again. And what they're doing, and this is the point, I think, what they're doing is they are singing, chanting, speaking in some kind of language that is very bizarre to hear. But what is far more important is that you can see it. They speak in a language which you see. And this is completely confounding because syntax is not something you ordinarily reach out and touch. And in this space, that's what's happening. And so like jewel self-dribbling basketballs, these things come running forward. And what they are doing with this visible language that they create is they're making gifts. They're making gifts for you. And they will say, which condenses as something which looks like a cross between a sop with camel, a Havana cigar, a piece of abalone, an opal, and a nuki, and they offer it to you. And you're looking at this thing, and as you look at it, it also transforms, changes, speaks, sings, uh, undergoes metastasis, undergoes metamorphosis, and these things are just accumulating. And each elf machine creature elbows others aside, says, look at this, 
Look at this. Take this. Choose me. This state of incredible frenzy goes on for about three minutes. And all the time the elves are saying, don't give way to wonder. Do not abandon yourself to amazement. Pay attention. Pay attention. Look at what we're doing. Look at what we're doing and then do it. Do it. And it, it's this thing where then everything stops and they wait and you feel like a, a torch, a spark lit in your belly that begins to move up your esophagus. And eventually when it reaches your mouth, your mouth just flies open and this language-like stuff comes out. Acoustically, it's but what you're you're not hearing it. the startled friends who sent you to this place are putting up with this what you're experiencing is a visual modality where these tones are surfaces shading colors insects jewels you are making something you know erase move forward add cerulean put in stippling it's that sort of thing and um and they go mad with joy when you do this so this is an experience which in some form I mean it will be different for each one of you but in some form at least what will be similar to my description is how dramatic it will be it will hit you as hard as it hit me if you do it right this to me this experience is of a fundamentally different order than any other experience this side of the yawning grave and why religions have not been built around it, why empires have not risen and fallen around the control of its sources, why theology has not enshrined it as its central exhibit for the presence of the other in the human world, I don't know. I can tell the secret. As you notice, nothing shuts me up. But a long, long time ago, I took an oath to tell all secrets that came my way. So how can it be then that a compound which each of us carries right here, right in the pineal gland, right in the Ajna Chakra, the Philosopher's Stone is no further away than that. How can this be secret from us? How can we be trapped in a dimension of such limitation and such mundaneness when our own nervous systems and the ecology around us and our own history over the past half million years argues that this is what we were born and bred for. This is where we belong. This is what at play in the fields of the goddess must mean. And somehow history has uh, made us dysfunctional, buried the mystery, made it, a, a, if at best, a piece of secret knowledge jealously guarded by somebody. I mean, I don't know. There are lots of mystery cults and secret societies in the world. I don't know if any of them are guarding DMT as a secret. I, I, it may be so. No one told me to keep my mouth shut. If this is not the secret that these lineages are guarding, then they're guarding an empty house. This is the secret. The Western mind is very queasy 
around these experiences that cast into doubt its cherished illusions about how reality is put together. And when you get to DMT, you have hit the main vein. I mean, I hold it in reserve as the ultimate convincer. I mean, that's for these, there are these people running around, you know, who say, oh, you people who are into drugs, <laughs> give me a good branch whiskey and a little TV. I, I, I think you're deluding yourself. Say, you do you? Well, have you got five minutes to invest in this proposition, my cheerful friend? Because if you do, have I got news for you. I met somebody who said, uh, there's a guy you've got to meet. He, he, lives near, he lives in Occidental, California. And I said, where's that? And he said, well, just, uh, he said, I've arranged it all. He said, you get on the Greyhound bus at so and so, you get off at Santa Rosa, California, and, and he'll meet you, stand by the road in this place, and he'll meet you. So I thought, okay. And he said, and here's a tape with him talking. So I listened on a Walkman on the bus journey, on the Greyhound bus journey to Santa Rosa, to this uh, Terence McKenna tape where he's talking about DMT, dimethyltryptamine, and its effects <laughs> on consciousness. So I'd never heard anything like this before, and I thought this is really amazing stuff. And so I stood in the appointed place, and after a couple of minutes, this battered golden Cadillac drew up with sort of peeling tra tail fins, and the windows scrolled down, and there's this guy with curly hair and dark glasses who leant out of the window and said, Dr. Sheldrake, I presume. <laughs> <laughs> I think that our evolutionary history is rooted in the past, but I've been reading on my journey here this novel, On the Edge, just published in England last week by Edward St. Aubin. It's set in California. The... Um, crucial scenes occur in Esalen. And, <laughs> and here's a conversation going on in the hot tubs on page 130. <clears throat> According to Terence McKenna, said Flavia, who happens to be a genius instead of an arrogant British jerk. <laughs> <laughs> History is rooted in the future. <laughs> so. <laughs> and when I returned to California, I was standing on a street corner in Santa Cruz in white pajamas, and a car stopped. An old friend from a previous lifetime said, There's somebody you have to meet. Get in the car. I had nothing to do. It sounded okay, and in that time, I believed that everything goes perfectly. You just go along with the flow, as they said. I didn't know it would be a two-hour drive. So I got in the car, there was the two-hour drive to Berkeley, and I was literally dumped out of the car on uh, Terence's front step. I never heard of Terence at that time, 1972. Mm -hmm. And I went in, and what happened then, I would still say, although we've had many wonderful talks and exciting, thrilling, and nutritious times in the meanwhile, that that was quite a miraculous chat. Many subjects came up. How to grow mushrooms, outer space, I don't know, anything you could think of, all passed by in the course of an hour or two. In this way, we became friends. We're going to be talking with Rupert Sheldrake, one of Britain's most controversial natural scientists. Sheldrake is the proponent of a theory called morphic resonance. He believes that the presence of the past actually impinges on processes in the present and the future. In other words, our world is as it is because of how it once was. This is not a genetic theory, not a theory of natural selection, but a field theory which holds that actions and situations in the past are able through the mere act of having happened to shape future and present events. 
Rupert, this immense Baroque building is the Museum of Natural History in Prague, and I wanted to bring you here because I thought it would be an appropriate place to discuss your ideas, because after all, a museum is a kind of archive of morphology. Exactly, with these stuffed animals and skeletons of like photographs, snapshots of forms frozen. But of course each animal behaves and moves, each animal develops as an embryo to its adult form and each one evolves. So it's triply dynamic, we have to reconstruct that in our minds. But the whole thing really is a reflection, I think, of the memory behind each species. Each species is the repository of an entire process of memory. Well now this is the part of your thinking which goes well beyond orthodox theoretical biology. Say a bit more about that. Well, the orthodox view is that all these amazing forms and all the behavior and instincts that the animals expressed were all coded in the chemical genes. So a materialist theory. That's a materialist theory. Um, I think it goes far beyond that and involves um, a memory of instincts, a memory of behavior, a memory of form. That is and not materially based. Not materially based. A collective memory on which each species draws. But in a case like that, then, um, why, how is it possible for new form to emerge at all? Well, this is where novelty comes in. Well, no one can account for novelty except perhaps yourself. <laughs> 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 so he took me to his um, A-frame in, in Occidental. You had to go up a sort of path, and you had to pass a hut. I wondered what was in the hut. He showed me later it was full of mushrooms. He had to go and vaporize them every few hours, you know, humidify the okay. atmosphere. Anyway, Ralph Abraham, his friend, was staying there, and Ralph's a chaos mathematician at the University of California at Santa Cruz. He's still there. And... These two guys were just talking. They met, you know, to talk to each other. And I just sort of parachuted in to this discussion. Ralph was there anyway. And we started talking, and 48 hours later, we were still talking. You know, we had a little bit of sleep and ate a little bit. But, I mean, this was the most interesting conversation I'd ever had. I think, therefore, that the premises on which this whole... Ralph called it a fantasy, a paranoid fantasy. The premises on which Thanks this is based. For that. Uh, <laughs> that helped. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, was, it took different forms. In last time we talked, I think it was a hypothetical time machine that would invade from the future and cause a, a collapse of normal human cognitive boundaries where the machine elves, the DMT experience, etc., would take over in a meltdown of human consciousness in That, too! <laughs> Mathematics is a tiny fraction of a formalized modeling of the possible, which is constrained by very particular rules and is entirely so far in the whole history of the subject under the aegis of the Platonic spirit. And I, I just think that to try and pin it all to that just seems a limitation that one doesn't need at this stage. Um, I mean, it may be helpful, it may be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> My God! I see why they're alarmed now. <clears throat> yes, well, I'm sure you're quite right. <clears throat> so, so what you're really calling for is the rebirth of poetry. Uh, well, and all kinds of lived experience through which we directly yes. relate to the world. <clears throat> you could pick up the newspaper tomorrow and prove me wrong, but this thing has already... I'll prove you wrong today. ...outlived itself yeah. many times. <laughs> <laughs> so you say. <laughs> well, I hear... Um, I don't know... Sometimes you sound as if you're a hired consultant from the World Trade Organization. <laughs> um, 
So I hope you... the check is in the mail. <laughs> time is not simple. Time is defined by how much goes on in a given moment, and we're learning how to push, you know, tetraflops of operations into a given second. So I think it's trickier than you think, and harder to corner me than you may suppose. Well, uh... <laughs> Now we can use, we have the great good fortune to be approaching the end of a millennium. Would it be redundant to say this only happens once in a thousand years? Yes. <laughs> and it's extraordinarily fortunate. Once I was in England and I ran into somebody I hadn't seen for 20 years. And I was amazed and I said to Rupert, how often do, does one get a chance to meet someone one hasn't seen for 20 years? And he said, well, I dare say, I suppose every 20 years or so. <laughs> <laughs> to me, all of these things are intelligence <clears throat> tests. And the people who pass the intelligence test are not worrying about pro bono proctologists from other star systems <laughs> showing up <laughs> unannounced <laughs> in their bedroom. So, uh, you know, we, we have perfected politeness. We have perfected the ability to listen to damn foolishness without betraying by so much as the flick of an eyebrow that we realize what we're in the presence in of. Now I think it's time to refine our mathematical skills, learn to think straight, and not be afraid to... Uh, denounce the pernicious forms of foolishness which are vitiating the energies of our community and making us appear uh, marginal and absurd in the discourse about truly transforming society. <laughs> Well, I can't wait to see this laboratory of clarity unfold before me tonight. As <laughs> and as all nonsense is dispelled, as the scalpel of reason is, is, is brought out by Terence. <clears throat> yes, well, it is an ambiguous enterprise and fraught with contradiction, but forward, ever forward. <laughs>
This is the end of the reign of the constipated nitwits and their blood-sucking stooges. Forward to the new order of the trans-temporal dream. Forward! My time wave theory, which would replace the scientific notion that time is a perfectly featureless and smooth surface, is the idea that time actually has a structure. It has a topology. It can be described somewhat in the way that a stock market can be described as a series of rising and falling fluctuations of novelty. And over long periods of time, this novelty has accumulated in the universe, building up first stars and then later complex organic molecules, ultimately issuing into intelligent life and a culture such as our own. I believe that process in the universe is not driven from the events of the past, but rather drawn toward a kind of transcendental attractiveness that is ahead of us in time. We can understand the overarching metaphor which holds it all together, which is the celebration of mind as play, the celebration of love as a genuine social value in the community. This is what they have suppressed so long. This is why they are so afraid of the psychedelics, because they understand that once you touch the inner core of your own and someone else's being, you can't be led into thing fetishism and consumerism. The message of psychedelics is that culture can be re-engineered as a set of emotional values rather than products. This is terrifying news. And if we are able to make this point, then we can pull back. We can pull back and we can transcend. Nine times in the last million years, the ice has ground south from the poles, pushing human populations ahead of it. And those people didn't fuck up. Why should we then? We are all survivors. We are the inheritors of a million years of striving for the unspeakable. And now, with the engines of technology in our hands, we ought to be able to reach out and actually exteriorize the human soul at the end of time. Invoke it into existence like a UFO and open the violet doorway into hyperspace and walk through it out of profane history and into the world beyond the grave, beyond shamanism, beyond the end of history, into the galactic millennium that has beckoned to us for millions of years across space and time. This is the moment a planet brings forth an opportunity like this only once in its lifetime. And we are ready, and we are poised, and as a community, we are ready to move into it, to claim it, to make it our own. It's there. Go for it. And thank you. History has these dominator types by the balls, and it's not going to land up. You know, history, history is a psychedelic experience. It's, it's the collective unfolding of the dream of our species in space and time. And we are at the apex. This is the peak. This is the second hour of the trip. We're going over the top.
one of the core elements of this psychedelic thing is freedom on the broadest scale. I mean, it truly is, and you will hear me use this phrase over and over again, boundary dissolving. And that's almost, for me, synonymous with freedom. This is what we want to do. We want to dissolve boundaries between the rich and the poor, the feminine and the masculine, the living and the dead. All boundaries do dissolve in the psychedelic experience. And the social metaphor that captures this is revolution. Revolution is an eruption from the unconscious. It is not a reasonable thing. It has a logic of its own. It's as though the overmind reaches down into the mechanics of political process and says, no, it won't be that way. It will be this way. And I said, my God, you know, and I actually did a mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the weirdest one of all? And it said, Hans Moravik is the weirdest one of all. I said, shit, you know, what, what am I, you know, I, I should bring him here and sit at his feet. The politics of the situation here in this mil millennial crisis I think the, res the reasonable response is to push the art pedal right through the floor. The way to escape the present cul-de-sac is an enormous outbreak of creativity of all sorts. We just need to overwhelm ourselves with creative expression. We are much more suited for dancing than for whatever it is that we have been doing. You know, whatever it was, it wasn't dancing. One of the funny insights that I had that I don't try to make sense of, that I in fact don't believe, but I thought it, and it, it was an emotionally opening thought, though it's absurd on the face of it, was when I was in the Amazon in these pastures, looking at these pastures full of these mushrooms, I kept thinking, you know, it's the lost part of the human brain. It's the part, it's that part of us is in these four, in these fields. That this, this mushroom, this, this is human flesh, this flesh. It's a strange kind of human, but hell, we're about to give legal rights to fetuses. We might as well extend legal rights to mushrooms and make them voting citizens. Uh, <laughs> because you see, it's intelligent. It's intelligent. It loves you, it can blow your mind, it can make you laugh, it can make you cry. Uh, there's no other way to relate to something like that except to love it in spite of yourself. I mean, you know, this is how you seduce someone. You make them laugh, you make them cry, you move them, you get them to drop their barriers, you get them to not be afraid. This is what it does to us. It's, it's, it seduces us back in to this relationship and I think we return to it with an immense sense of relief. It's just like, ah, oh, you know.
The desert sighs in the bed, and the crack in the teacup opens a door to the land of the dead. And I said, how can I take some of this home with me? And he said, the stranger is always at home. And I said, does that mean that I can do this? And as the song went down, the air thickened between us. And behind the head known, the chief elf, the honcho sprite, I could see the tree spirit ladies, the river mixies, and the mermaids. And they moved forward and passed me and beyond me. And the last thing they said before I lost sight of them, they turned to me and they said, If the universe is evolving deeper and deeper into complexity, faster and faster, and if now in a human lifetime we can see a small portion of this curve, it no longer appears flat to us because of our nearness in relation, you understand what I'm saying? And that we can actually discern the curve. And so that means, I believe, that by extrapolating this process, we should then logically conclude that we are very near, relative to the life of the universe, we are very near to the place where this ramping up of complexity will become so excruciatingly rapid that more change will happen in a single week than happened in the previous 13 billion years. And that then there will come a moment where more will happen in a single minute than happened in the previous 13 billion. And then a moment will come when more will happen in, in 6.55 times 10 to the uh, 23rd uh, erg seconds. More will happen than has happened. People say, well, but that's crazy. I mean, how, what kind of universe is that, that ramp, that <laughs> Well, wait a minute, what's so crazy about this? Let's look at what the competition is peddling. <laughs> uh, what the competition would have you believe is that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment for no reason. Well, now, whatever you think about that theory, in the interest of being awake, please notice that that is the limit case for credulity. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean that if you can believe that, you can believe anything. That is the most improbable proposition the human mind can conceive of. I challenge you to top it. You know, I mean, I know the Scientologists think God is a clam on another planet, but I don't think that tops this idea. <laughs> that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment for no reason. That is the art, that's article of faith number one. I say, no, no, this, this, if we're talking about universes that spring from nothing, if we're, if we're going to talk like that, then 
surely such universes occur in a situation of great complexity. In other words, if we're going to look for an enormous eruption of emergent phenomena, an enormous, sudden, unexpected download of novelty, we shouldn't look in a domain of zero space, zero time, zero energy, zero anti-entropic organization. That's the worst place to look. That's the least likely place where such a singularity would be would spring out. Where should you look? If you believe in this jabberwock, this chimera, this particular beast, where should you hunt this snark? You should hunt it in domains of immense complexity, where you have matter, energy, light, chemistry, language, machines, people, cultures, intentionality, minds, minds, minds. And if you throw all that stuff together and shake it up, it's maybe not a sure thing that you will get a singularity, but you're certainly betting right. Now you've figured it out. So I, I think that uh, science is, is extremely hostile to the idea that the universe is complexifying and complexifying more and more rapidly. <laughs> so, uh, I think it's just going to get weirder and weirder and weirder and finally it's going to be so weird that people are going to have to talk about how weird it is. And at that point, novelty theory can come out of the woods. Uh, because eventually people are going to say, what the hell is going on? It's just too nuts. It's not enough to say it's nuts. You have to explain why it's so nuts. The mushroom said to me once, it said, this is what it's like when a species prepares to depart for the stars. You don't depart for the stars under calm and orderly conditions. It's a fire in a madhouse. And that's what we have, the fire in the madhouse at the end of time. This is what it's like when a species prepares to move on to the next dimension. The entire destiny of all life on the planet is tied up in this. We are not acting for ourselves or from ourselves. We are, we happen to be the point species on a transformation that will affect every living organism on this planet at its conclusion. I think we take our humanness too much for granted. I don't think we realize uh, how nasty, brutish, and short most of life has been over the centuries. And how really only in the, within the confines of the 20th century has uh, a level of uh, comfort and food availability and shelter and uh, basic creature needs been met to the point where most people can begin to lead the philosophical life that previously was uh, the privilege of emperors, kings, great courts. Now we all indulge ourselves. We all have the philosopher king's point of view. We all uh, have a model of history, a model of the future, and we all uh, feel capable of stepping into the shoes of our leaders and discharging that responsibility. Well, in order to do that, I think we need to overcome our amnesia about how we got to this place. I don't see you see, what science would have you believe, and explicitly implies, is that we are an aberration. Here over here you have nature, the beautiful rainforests, the wonderful coral reefs, the cemetery of the hummingbird, the sea urchin, and the butterfly. And here you have us, grimy, tawdry, polluting, 
ugly, driven, in equilibrium, in disequilibrium, in denial. I don't believe that. I believe that this kind of thinking that breaks humanity away from the rest of nature is the first of the great disempowering myths by which the Western mind has enslaved itself. And we are not outside of nature. We are not a runaway, toxic process. We are not a mutation. We are, in fact, that part of nature which has been deputized for a purpose. We are the energy gathering aspect of the Gaian mind. We are the language forming capacity of nature herself. You may know the concept of a catalyst in chemistry. A catalyst is something which when you stir it into a chemical reaction, the reaction proceeds more quickly, but the catalyst itself is not destroyed. And this is what I think we are. We are a strategy on the part of the Gaian mind to produce an effect that would otherwise take much, much longer to produce. The main effect of the presence of human life on this planet has been to vastly accelerate the speed at which nature is able to uh, creatively express herself. Why is it important for you to do this? I wonder myself. Um, <laughs> you mean, am I the uh, alien ambassador, whether I like it or not? <laughs> well, I, often when asked this question, I've said, you know, it beats honest work. I mean, my brother is a PhD in three subjects and uh, works in hard science. and. Uh, uh, it, I don't think it's brought him immense happiness, not that he's despondent, but uh, I was always kind of a slider, uh, you know, and uh, certainly when I reached La Chirera in 1971, I had a price on my head by the FBI, I was running out of money, I was at the end of my rope, and then uh, they recruited me and said, you know, with a mouth like yours, there's a place for you in our organization. And, uh, you know, I've worked in deep background positions about which the best, the less said, the better. And then, you know, about 15 years ago, they shifted me into public relations and I've been there uh, to the present. Uh, I think ideas get me high uh, and I like the feeling of understanding and uh, I love diversity to the point of weirdness. I think of myself as a pretty savvy person and not uh, easily led into false dogma. And yet, this is such a strange idea. And so, it's basically a plea for help. I am, I, it's, it's, it's not a cult. It's not that I want you to join me in believing in this. It's that this is so outlandish that join me as a scientist, would join a research team, and let's cut it to pieces and show that it was simply a misunderstanding of information theory coupled with bad mathematics spliced onto a weak ontology or something like that, you know? Um, because this idea, I, 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 could under, I could live with the time wave 
If I only had to read about it in Time magazine and that it was being developed by Negroponte and Prigozhin, the thing that sets up the cognitive dissonance for me is that I, from the point of view of most people, thought it up. And I am so aware of my limitations that to me that's the strongest argument there is that it's malarkey, you know. And then I read books like Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions and it says, you know, this is how it happens. Some guy, marginal, not at the center of the field, uh, and somewhat at loose ends, but usually with a broad education, gets it, you know. I have spent a lot of time educating myself about what it would mean if this were true. In other words, how big a revolution is it? And it's an enormous revolution. The implications are staggering. For example, if it's true that time is a fluctuating variable, as this so strongly argues, then science as practiced for the past 500 years is out the window. Because that kind of science is based on the concept of experiment. And experiment has built into it the concept of what's called a restoration of initial conditions. That means you can go back to the start and run the experiment again. This is saying, as Heraclitus said, you never step into the same river twice. And consequently, the idea of, of repetitive experiment is shown to be intellectually bankrupt. We could almost say of science that it is the study of those phenomena so crude that the time in which they occur does not affect them. And so falling balls, uh, you know, gas diffusion, simple things, it doesn't matter where in time they occur. But things like the building of an empire, the waging of a war, the evolution of a species, the conquest of a biome by a new set of genes, these things, timing is everything and dictates success or failure. There's four months, two months, one month, 15 days, seven days, the last seven days, the last three days, the last day, the last 23 hours. <laughs> I am not going to do this till hell freezes over. I have a, a whole other plan for myself. And uh, I think also, you know, once you crusade for 10 years, if you haven't captured Jerusalem, you better go back to farming in Provence. And, and that's more or less metaphorically what I intend to do. Pardon me? No, it's, I'll tell you some of my plans uh, briefly because it doesn't relate to this. Um, 220 species of trilobite occur in the shales of southern Bohemia. I plan to go to Prague and organize the peasants of Bohemia to collect these various species of trilobites, ship them into a central warehouse in Prague while we will identify, photograph them, and issue a very high-end catalog for collectors of rare fossils. Mm. And uh, I will become the trilobite maven of Prague 6 and uh, disappear from this domain. Because I think I've said all I have to say. I mean, not today, thank God, uh, but in the course of doing all this. Uh, I don't like the part of what I do that is a cult of personality. I don't like it that a white guy sits at the front of the room 
and pontificates. And I don't know if you've figured out this shuffle, but I have, and I know that I don't know anything more than you know, really. And that it's just a, a funny circumstance of fate that you sit and listen and I speak, because there are no experts. And there is only, uh, you know, the integrity of doing and having done. And really, if you get the message, you, you will be able to transcend the need for any more of this, because it's really a message of self-trust and self-empowerment. And then what I'm also trying to create is a community of shared associations about these weird states so that we don't have to all privately think we're losing our marbles. You know, let those who talk to the elves find each other and band together. I am not um, one, I, I am basically a scientist without portfolio because no academic institution would ever trust me with a portfolio. But I, I move in the domain of the gurus, the channelers, the pontificators, and those with secret revealed knowledge from Atlantis and Lemuria. But I have contempt for all of that, whether it's true or not, because they got there the wrong way. You know, you have to come through uh, the rules of evidence and reason. Reason is not science. Don't confuse them. I'm very much a critic of science and the scientific method, but I don't think reason can be tossed out with that uh, bathwater. Plato, who all the rest of philosophy is a footnote upon. Plato said, you know, that the key lay in the concepts the good, the true, and the beautiful. The good, what is it? Tricky, tricky, tricky. The true, what is it? Trickier, even trickier. The beautiful, what is it? Easy to discern. The beautiful is easy to discern. You are going to be condemned to live out the consequences of your taste. <laughs> really, really. And if you have no taste, you know, God help you. Because you are, you are self-condemned to an appalling nightmare. Uh, you won't be getting it. All the subtle stuff will go by you uh, while, while your head is uh, filled with cant, nonsense, foolishness. So again, the, the, the metaphor of, uh, of the dream and of making choices based on beauty and beauty is, uh, is downloaded into the human cultural milieu, largely through dreams. Uh, other ideas may also come in dreams, but I think studies have shown that, uh, that architects, designers, people who are actually at the top of the, of the pyramid in any design process are very aware of their dreams, their reveries their insights. So that's, that's the way to set the compass, not toward truth, not toward the good, not because these aren't fine things, but because they're so slippery, but toward beauty. And with that in place, uh, to my mind, life, hope follows as a natural consequence. So the real world political work that Kat and I do is associated with botanical dimensions 
we conceived it together many, many years ago. And then about six years ago, Cat took it over, put it on its official feet, made it a, a, a non-profit foundation, and has run it day to day since then uh, with tremendous energy and efficiency. So I'd like to acknowledge Cat McKenna here. my better half, in fact, my only good half. <laughs> I, let's see, I first came to Telluride in uh, 1978 with my new baby, my first child, and my new husband, uh, Terrence McKenna, at the time. And, um, and uh, we had gotten together, we met way back in the mid-60s in um, the Middle East, actually, but we got together in uh, 1975 because that was the year that he and his brother um, figured out how to grow psilocybin mushrooms at home in your kitchen. And um, once he figured that out, uh, he said, he never used the word prayer, but he put out a call to the universe to please send him the perfect mushroom mail order bride. <laughs> <laughs> And um, somehow that, I hadn't seen him in years, but somehow that landed in my mailbox. And um, with, with an inquiry, he'd heard where I was living at the time, an inquiry and five grams of newly grown mushrooms. And um, so I took those and read that letter a number of times and saw that my destiny was laid out. But just to make sure, because I had a job, a commitment I couldn't leave for some months, for over six months he kept sending me love letters by that time with mushrooms in them. <laughs> This trip that I had in Hawaii, I thanked God that somebody was there, that Kat was there specifically, because just the sound of her voice completely ameliorated a whole spectrum of, of hard to describe but very icky things that, I was, that were threatening to overwhelm me. And I don't have trips like that very much where I have to where I need somebody there, so it was fortunate that it was like that. But no, I'm not advocating that if you've never taken mushrooms, you go up on a mountain in the dark and take eight grams. I mean, it might be good for you, but I'm not advocating it, because <laughs> it might not be good for you, you know. Uh, but eventually, you know, Plotinus called the mystical experience the flight of the alone to the alone, and there is something about that. You, the last dance you do, you do alone, and it can't be otherwise. The main point out of all these statements about drugs and this and that is, you know, if it doesn't scare you, it's not worth doing. And it certainly scares me every time. I mean, I don't want you to think. There's nothing heroic about it. It's just terrifying, and it's the only form of terror I will submit to. I will not jump from airplanes. I do not shoot the rapids. I do not rock climb. I'm a bookish person. But I will submit to that terror because it seems to make sense. But it isn't unterrifying. It is exceedingly terrifying. That's where I think it lies. And that's why these questions of abuse and all that can't arise. God, nobody abuses these drugs as far as I can find out, unless they do too little, unless they are one grammars or something. Uh, I mean, a, a wonderful thing to do if you want to do some exploratory chemistry is take, uh, take half a dose, take half a dose of mushrooms and then after a couple of hours, smoke some pergamon harmala in a, in a bong or a pipe. And the MAO inhibiting characteristic of the harmaline will immediately lift the curtain for about 15 minutes on a very spectacular series of very cool hallucinations. In other words, they're hallucinations where you can just sit and look thinking, 
my goodness, this is fascinating and compelling, <laughs> rather than the other kind of hallucination where you're... <gasps> <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we call this uh, mushroom plus pagaman harmala combination vegetable television <laughs> because it, it's approximately that engaging, but but very very uh, non-threatening and, and reassuring for beginners. I had a very weird, in fact, you know, one of the high water weirdness events of my life was when I was young, I used to, uh, I was, I wanted the DMT flash to last longer, so I used to smoke it uh, at the height of LSD trips, and one uh, Christmas vacation, this rooming house that I managed in Berkeley, had been everybody had gone home for Christmas I thought and so I decided I would take some LSD and smoke DMT and um, and so I took the LSD and then I smoked the DMT it was just nuts I mean it's nuts enough but this was like turbocharged nuts it went on and on and on and finally I uh, there was a woman who I rented a room to upstairs uh, named uh, Rosemary, who was supposed to be in Minnesota. And she was an um, actress and very projective and did everything with great flair. And she apparently came back early from Christmas vacation. So she hit the front steps running of this house and, and used her key to let herself into the front door and came right around to my door and started beating on my door well I am by nature a very paranoid person I mean I can be up the Rio Yaguas Yasu in the middle of the Amazon basin and if I'm out in the rainforest smoking a joint and a stick is broken anywhere near me I immediately hide the dope in a, in just, you know I'm very paranoid so this woman lets herself in and comes and beats with her clenched fist on, on my bedroom door. Well, I like underwent a, a coronary thrombosis or something, and I was in the elf space, and they were screeching and chattering and showing me all this stuff. And when she <laughs> did this, I like I I flew off the bed. I jumped like I two feet in the air and, and landed on my my feet and it was it was as though and don't try this at home folks it, it, it was as though the uh, this sudden flash of adrenaline and this sudden movement that I made broke up the ordinary division between the trip and norm normality or something anyway I pulled the trip with me into the room I was now standing in the room, eyes open, but the, the elf creatures had come with me and everything had just been like jacked up to some immense level of intensity and there were these rotating geometric things in the room uh, hanging in the air and it was like moving in this jerky motion, this thing was going click 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 and it was faceted and every time it would make this large metallic click these plastic triangle shaped brightly colored chips or something like little pieces of, of floor tile or something would fly across the room and each one of them had a letter on it in an alien language sort of like Hebrew or Sanskrit and it was just there were several of these machines and these things were ricocheting off the walls and I had an elf hanging off each hand and I was turning around and I was just saying holy shit you know I pull I, I'm 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 uh, and I and then she's still beating on the door you know so I stagger over to the door fling it back and look at her and say something like wait dukwam wapsi ho wani kwam hapti kuputi and 
then she realized at that point what my problem was and, uh, and retreated. But I, I've never forgotten. It, it's the one time that, it, that they went literary on me. And not only did I see them, not only did I hear them, but I, they were printing on the air the message as well. Very curious. Language has made us more than a group of pack hunting monkeys. It's made us a group of pack hunting monkeys with a dream. <laughs> and the fallout from that dream has given us our glory and our shame, our weaponry, our technology, our art, our hopes, our fears, all of this arises out of our own ability to articulate and to communicate with each other. And I use this in the broadest sense. I mean, for me, the glory of the human animal is cognitive activity, song, dance, sculpture, poetry, uh, all of these cognitive activities, when we participate in them, we cross out of the domain of animal organization and into the domain of a genuine relationship to the transcendent. So it, it, what, I, uh, what I'm hopeful for and what I actually see happening, I mean, I think that we're on the right track the birth of a new kind of humanity is going to take place, but there are still a lot of decisions to be made. How violent shall this birth be? What toll shall it take upon our mother, the earth? What shape shall the baby be in when it finally is delivered? These are the decisions that artists can mediate and control. Most people are afraid of the unconscious. This is why uh, you, know, you can have a, a psychedelic compound like DMT, which is very much like ordinary brain chemistry, uh, appears completely physiologically harmless, uh, only lasts 10 minutes, extremely powerful, and generally in this society you have no takers. This is because there has been a failure of moral courage. And the failure of moral courage is uh, perhaps most evident in our own community, the community of, uh, of the artists. In a way, uh, it's the poets that have failed us because they have not uh, provided a song or sung a vision that we could all move in concert to. So now we are in the absurd position of being able to do anything. And what we are doing is fouling our own nest and pushing ourselves toward planetary toxification and extinction. This is because the poets, the artists have not articulated and a, um, a moral vision. The moral vision must come from the unconscious. It doesn't have to do, I believe, with uh, you know, these um, post-meaning movements in art, deconstructionism, and this sort of thing. I mean, I'm basically putting out a very conservative, but I think, um, exciting program for art. That art's task is to save the soul of mankind. And that anything less is a dithering while Rome burns. Because if the artists 
who are self-selected for uh, being able to journey into the other. If the artist cannot find the way, then the way cannot be found. You only have to avail yourselves of these shamanic tools to rediscover a nature which is not mute, as Sartre said, in a kind of culmination of the modern viewpoint. Nature is not mute. It is man who is deaf. And the way to open our ears, open our eyes, and reconnect with the intent of a living world is through the psychedelics. Each artist is an antenna to the transcendental other. And as we go with our own history into that thing and then create a unique confluence of our uniqueness and its uniqueness, we collectively create an arrow, an arrow out of history, out of time, perhaps even out of matter, that will redeem then the idea uh, that man is good. Redeem the idea that man is good. This is the promise of art and its fulfillment is never more near than the present moment. And when you understand how the world really works, I'm beginning to get just a hint of it. It works through uh, love and dream and intention to connect through love and dream and intention toward connection. And these are ultimately irrational values. And they ultimately must be irrationally embraced because the momentum toward a rational conclusion is tremendous, but unfortunately completely fatal. And this is the invitation that the artist has always extended toward a radical break with the momentum of rationalism. It's simply that now, in this moment of tremendous crisis, when the artist is at last called upon to perform, and there must be no stitches dropped, because this dance is the dance of transformation of the planet itself. This is the moment of empowering this is what all the shamanism of the past built toward, this final magical invocation. Uh, James Joyce said, man will be dirgible. That's simply a way of saying that we will find a way to make our dreams and the dreams of the planet and the life it carries one dream. And the way to do it is to reconnect up to the Gaian mind through the channels of communication that were always there, but that have not been really taken up since the late Neolithic. It's time for us to call home, and uh, you know how to do it. It's just a matter of having the courage to do it, to act, and then to have that empowering act spread back through the psychology of the planet. I am very optimistic. I think we are awakening to a new day from a long, long night of the soul. But it must be done collectively, gently, lovingly, and with a complete faith that we are an infant held in the arms of nature, that nature wants this to happen, that we are not an aberration. We are granted peculiar, but we are not an aberration. We are a necessary oddness to the completion of the whole, and this is our glory, 
And this is why we've been graced with self-reflection. And we can redeem that tremendous empowerment by going forward in love and faith to save the world through art and the pursuit of meaning. Thank you very, very much. Is there anything that you do every day or every other, you know, month that this you month just... I spend as, as many hours a day as I possibly can uh, smoking cannabis. <laughs> this is a practice this is the that... the secret of McKenna's philosophy. Thank you very much, people. Uh, this he is a practice now. that I've adhered to since my 17th summer. I don't know if it's the proper place to tell it, but once I became concerned that I did too much smoking, and uh, so I decided I would quit. First of all, I wanted to see if I could quit, and then I wanted to see how much of my interior life was actually riding on this ocean of cannabis ingestion. So it so happened that the conditions for the experiment were perfect because I was arriving on a small desert island uh, in the Seychelles group in the Indian Ocean and had rented a house on this island in order to write a book. So I uh, had this Mombasan bomber weed and a lid of it and I just rolled it up and nailed it above my kitchen door and decided that I would not smoke until I had finished writing this book and uh, was relieved to learn that I had enough self-control that this was possible. I mean, I didn't sleep a wink for eight nights, but uh, I, I did not resort to breaking my pledge. And, uh, and I slowly realized it was all right. What it seemed to do was I spent a lot more time reading and had much more interesting dreams and otherwise it didn't seem to be any big deal and I wrote this book then and it took me about six weeks and I promised myself that when the book was finished I would then allow myself to smoke up this lid of weed before I left this island so finally I finished and I was very diligent I wrote every day at 8 a.m. for till noon I typed and then I would take my dogs and explore the sign and I had this very set regimen and finally the book was finished and uh, I rolled these huge bombers and dragged my lawn chair out under the coconut palms and waited for the sunset to get really going and then I just flared and consumed about three of these things in about five minutes and I was just waiting for this sense of relief and accomplishment and uh, clarity to sweep over me and this thing began to happen and I like pushed it away and then it came back and I pushed it away and finally I realized I had to look at what this was that it was just becoming overwhelming and then I looked at it and what it was was it was the incontrovertible instantaneous, deep, unarguable realization that this book I had written was dog shit. <laughs> and I was just frozen with there, you know, just sitting in this chair quaking with this realization. And up to a half an hour ago, I had this vision of myself returning triumphantly to Berkeley like Lenin entering Moscow with the tome raised high. Don't worry, brothers and sisters, it's all figured out. And I realized, you know, that it was a catastrophe, an abortion, a monstrosity. So I just was, you know, really set back. So then I just shrugged my shoulders and said, oh, okay. I will smoke day and night until I can try and save this thing, if it can be saved. And I did. I mean, I, I did 
smoke day and night, and I did struggle with this thing, and it was not possible to breathe life into that corpse. This, this book, I'll just tell you the title in order to convince you that this thing should have died a morning. It was called, <clears throat> I blush to tell you, it was called Crypto Rap, Meta, Meta Electrical Speculations on Culture. <laughs> terrible, terrible. So I realized then, at that point, that I was a fool to try to navigate life without cannabis. This woman in black leather bondage underwear and fishnet stockings I came to and after this huge wave hit, I came to and she was standing over me with her legs apart and she put her face right down next to mine and said, is it strong enough for you, asshole? That was uh, <laughs> a moment of major manifestation. <laughs> From the time that there is an awareness of the existence of the soul, we'll say circa 50,000 BP, until the resolution of the apocalyptic potential, there's something like 50,000 years, which in biological time is only a moment, but it is the entire span of history times five. In that period, everything hangs in the balance because it is a mad rush from monkeydom to starshiphood. And in the leap across those 25,000 years, energies are released, religions are shot off like sparks, philosophies evolve and die, science arises, magic arises, all of these things which control power with greater and lesser degrees of ethical constancy appear. There is the possibility, as in the metaphor of dying, there is the possibility of mucking it up, of aborting the species transformation into a hyperspatial intellect. We are now, there can be no doubt that we are now in the final seconds of that crisis, a crisis which involves the end of history, the departure from the planet, the triumph over death, and the release of the individual from matter. We are, in fact, closing distance with the most profound event a planetary ecology can encounter, which is the freeing of life from the dark chrysalis of matter, the old metaphor of psyche as the butterfly is a species-wide metaphor. We must undergo a metamorphosis in order to survive the momentum of the historical forces already in motion. Well, if you know anything about evolutionary biology, you know that man is considered to be an, an unevolving species. In other words, sometime in the last 100,000 years, with the invention of culture, the, uh, the biological evolution of man ceased, and evolution became a cultural phenomenon. Tools, languages, and philosophies began to evolve, but the human somatype began to remain the same. And so we are very much like people a long time ago. But technology is the real skin of our species. Man, correctly seen in the context of the last 500 years, is an extruder of a technological shell. We take in matter that has a low degree of organization. We put it through mental filters and we extrude Lindisfarne Gospels, space shuttles, all of these things. This is what we do. We're like coral animals embedded in a technological reef of extruded psychic objects. In other words, the body must become an interiorized hologrammatic object embedded in a solid-state hyperdimensional matrix which is eternal. 
so that man wanders through Elysium in his body, experiencing all the pleasures of the flesh, but not realizing that he is a holographic projection of a solid state matrix that is micro miniaturized, super conducting, and nowhere to be found. It is part of the plenum. And uh, we, all history is about producing prototypes of this situation with greater and greater closure toward the ideal so that airplanes, automobiles, condominiums, space shuttles, space colonies, uh, starships of the hardware, speed of light, spin busy drive type, all of these are, as Merciliad says, self transforming images of flight that speak volumes about man's aspiration to self-transcendence so that we are our wish our salvation and our only hope basically is to end the historical crisis by becoming uh, the alien by ending alienation by recognize the alien as the self in fact and all these other images, the starship, the space colony, all that, these are precursors. Again, the idea that history is the shockwave of eschatology. As you close distance with the eschatological object, the reflections it is throwing off become more and more true to the thing itself. And in the final moment, God stands revealed. There are no more reflections of... Uh, of the mystery, the mystery in all its nakedness then is seen and nothing else exists. The emergence of organic life from what preceded it is as dramatic a miracle as anyone could imagine. The emergence of language from mute bestiality, which is only a hundred thousand years in the past, is as dramatic a miracle as anyone could imagine. The emergence of a planet instantaneously unified by electricity and media is, and this is only 50, 60 years in our past, it's still going on, is as dramatic a miracle as anyone could imagine. It's absolutely irrational to not be filled with the fire of consuming hope. You just have to overcome the leveling that we inherit from these empty existential scientific ideas. And when we do that, and lift our eyes to the real, living, spiritually um, empowered reality that exists in nature, in society, in our lover, in ourselves, then you see that the peacock's tail, the cow de pavones, is a, a transcendental object at the end of time, an enormous uh, unspeakable something that beckons across the historical landscape that casts an enormous shadow that reaches clear back to the earliest moments of the universe that we have always been in the grip of that iridescent strange attractor it has propelled our poetry our art our best moments have always been when the tiny spark of that alchemical completion burned for a moment in our mind, in our life, in our perception. And we occupy a special position in regard to this. Millions, thousands of generations of human beings have come and gone and could only glimpse this in the ecstasy of eroticism and psychedelic empowerment and ritual magic. But we are the last people. Beyond us lies the mystery. If we have but the courage 
to move forward into that abyss, to believe that nature will reward the dreamer. It cannot wander much longer. All of the preconditions have been met and the peacock's tail grows daily whiter and more radiant and more brilliant as we sense now, breaking into our dreams, breaking into our waking lives, the presence of this attractor. It has always given people meaning, but we are the privileged inheritors of that meaning, and we have then the privilege of putting it all together in one piece and standing ready at the end of history to go into the mystery and be completed. It is upon us. Every messiah, every religious ontology, every uh, manager of every booth that this exhibit is reflecting a distorted scintilla of the spiritual reality of the transcendental object at the end of time. Every one of us is a particularized and distorted image of this transcendental object into which we are being dissolved, into which global culture is being uh, dissolved. So, uh, <laughs> well, so what? <laughs> So we can cut into this cycle at any point. We can become aware of it, we can become part of it, we can deny it. There is no loss in the circuit. There is no blame. Becoming then, what psychedelic means is, it means claiming this dimension as your own. You know, Plato said time is the moving image of eternity. That moving image of eternity can be beheld in the silent darkness of the mind on five grams of psilocybin. And if you, if you think the universe is mundane, if you think there are no more frontiers to cross, no more adventures to be had, I'm telling you, you can turn your living room into the bridge of Magellan's ship on a long Saturday evening with five grams of psilocybin in silent darkness. We are living in the most empowering age in human history because all of the energy of the ancestors, not only the human ancestors, but our animal, our primate ancestors, all of that energy pours into, is focused into this moment. We are the transition generation. We have one foot in matter and one foot in hyperspace. And we can redeem the trust of thousands of years. All of the horror of history can be redeemed if we don't drop the ball. Every pogrom, every instance of racial, sexual, or minority persecution can be redeemed if we give the human adventure meaning. And we give it meaning by discovering the totality within ourselves and then exemplifying it for each other. And this dissolves boundaries, empowers the weak, uh, enlightens the strong, and brings hope to all. And it can only be done if we accept the gifts which nature has offered us. Thank you very, very much. The last thought I want to leave you with, which is a sort of a coincidentia positorum thought, because it will bum some and exalt others, is the one thing that I've learned 
from psychedelics that seems secure over all the decades and the, you know, embracing one idea, one ideology after another. The one thing that seems secure is a, a truth that is hard to hear in the context of a dominator culture with an obsession with the material world. And, and that truth is that nothing lasts. Nothing lasts. You know, your enemies will fade, your friends will fade, your fortune, your poverty, your disappointments, your dreams, everything is in the process of changing into something else. So your agony is about to be assuaged. On the other hand, your happiness is about to be destroyed. So the, the obligation that comes out of this realization is an obligation to the, the immediate moment, to this thing that I've been calling the felt moment of immediate experience. It isn't who you were or what you were or who you will be or what you will be. It's the felt moment of immediate experience and this has been robbed from us by media and by our tendency to denigrate ourselves to see the world in terms of the great ones not here whoever they are aristotle madonna jesus whatever your particular bent is uh, the overcoming of neurosis of unhappiness of toxic lifestyles is uh, the felt presence of immediate experience in the body in the moment and you know psychedelics sexuality gastronomy sport dance these are the things which put you in the felt presence of the moment and that's really all you ever possess your memories are eroding away the futures you anticipate will mostly not come to pass and the real uh, richness is in the moment and it's not necessarily some kind of be here now feel good thing because it doesn't always feel good but it always feels it is a domain of feeling it's primary language is not primary ideology is not primary the propagation of future and past vectors is not primary what's primary is the felt presence of experience and that is the source of love and that is the source of community. If, so, I'm, if someone had never taken psychedelics and had no interest in it, and had come here because they thought this was the Traegering group, I think they would be truly alarmed and disturbed by what they hear, because we appear to be mad people, because we appear to be fully engaged with an unseen, invisible world, and we're calling it the cause of history, the purpose for the future, and the basis for everything going on between us. But uh, nobody said life was simple, because every single person uh, who does this is seeing things no human eye has ever fallen upon and uh, it is a realm of ideas and we do each bring back different souvenirs from that place we are all equally qualified we don't know who will spot the whale but everyone should have their eye peeled because that's what we're doing we're searching for an encounter with leviathan nature is god that was the informing vision of moby dick and uh, it's a good one to carry as a metaphor into this into the psychedelic experience there again was a perfect example of the male ego unable to release into the matrix of nature until it literally dragged them into the depths through the building of community through the music and the dissolution of boundaries through the use of these psychedelics the shaman are showing how you create an archaic style culture after 5,000 years of human history. Because we can't abandon technology. We have six billion people on this uh, planet. But the shaman and the rave culture 
are showing us how we can take what was best in the society of 25,000 years ago and bring it into the center of our lives and live it again and create a community of caring, intelligent people who've got their heart connected to their head and their heart connected to their feet so that through dance, feeling, philosophy, sexuality, art, uh, we manifest the creativity that is going to be necessary for us to save ourselves. This is the key, you see. If the expansion of consciousness does not play a major role in the human future, what kind of future is it going to be? My goals are very modest. I'm very pleased that it chose to confide so concrete an idea in me. But if it had never chosen to do that, I still would die a happy man with the unspeakable experiences of beauty that it has shared with me. Because my psychedelic trips these days are not about the time wave. The time wave is pretty much a, a done a done deal. So I think it's like everything else in life. Intent is everything and impeccability means in that domain do not seek to use. Do not seek to use. It's a religious mystery and that doesn't mean it's an unsolved problem. It means a mystery and uh, life is only worth living as long as the mysteries continue to inform, transform, and inspire us. And the, the last thing I want to say, and then I'll leave you, is the truth can take care of itself. You don't have to approach the truth with eyes lowered and gaze averted on bended knee. That's how you approach bullshit. But the truth is so powerful that you can kick the tires, turn over the engine, check the odometer, and nobody is offended. Truth is real. It can stand the test. And that's why, you know, I went all over the world looking at various spiritual traditions. I don't feel it's putting them down to say that they were ineffective because they were all great aspirations. But the only real open doorway that I ever found uh, were the plans. This works. You know, in other spiritual disciplines, everybody wants to go faster. They want the Roshi to give them further empowerments. They want further uh, information, postures, secret teachings, so forth and so on. Once you reach the psychedelic experience, the accelerator is far less interesting than the location of the brakes. That's what we're looking for. We're not trying to push. We all know how to push this so fast we can't stand it. personal act of courage made by the individual, an act of courage which involves surrender. Surrender is the opposite side of the coin of ego. The central issue of our times is our inability to surrender to what we know is right. We have the ability to feed the hungry. We have the ability to educate our children, to clean up our environment, to eliminate sexism, to eliminate racism. The question is, can we change our minds fast enough? Not can we change our minds, but can we change them fast enough? A return to archaism, 
with the lessons learned in history. That's where we were happy. The fall was a fall into a veil of tears, into a world of uh, limitation and pain and suffering and infectious disease and so forth and so on. It's a prodigal journey into a lower dimension that can now be ended by a collective cultural decision to commit to this Taoist, shamanistic, feminized, cybernetic, caring, aware, present kind of being. I mean, it's nothing more than what each of us is in our very best moments. But we have to extend those very best moments to fill whole lifetimes. That's interesting. The age thing. That's great. Old man, Old man McKinney. It must be approaching 2012 now. He's... <laughs> Really, I think that uh, the spirit of uh, childlike, untrammeled curiosity is what we're striving for. Not the anal retentive, uh, rational person. Not the all go for anything channeling flake, but an attitude of we don't have to look far for miracles because they're all around us. Everything is astonishing. The universe on its surface is alive with mystery. We are not going away. We are not slack jawed, dazed, glazed, unemployable, psychotic creeps. We are pillars of society. You can't run your computers, your fashion houses, your publishing houses, your damn magazines. You can't do anything in culture without psychedelic people in key positions. And this is the great unspoken truth of American creativity. And so I think it's time basically to come out of the closet and just say, you know, I'm stoned and I'm proud. <laughs> so, <laughs> if that's a problem for you, you got a problem, fella. <laughs> What bothers me about all these new drugs is that they are escapes from the obligation to do strong drugs. I think that the great popularity of cocaine is because nobody ever disgraced themselves on it, you know? Nobody ever started babbling about how re much they regretted what a jackass they were. <laughs> and uh, that's what the psychedelics do. They make you get down and grovel in the dirt. God, I had this trip in Hawaii that was just horrible, you know, where it was saying, you know, you think you're such hot stuff, you won't even get off your ass and go shit in the field. 
you know, I want to see you grovel, man. You sit up in front of all these people and pontificate on how it's all put together. Face me now in the darkness and tell me how it's all put together. I just hate it, you know. <laughs> it puts me through the ringer. But nothing else is really useful. Can I ask you a personal question? You can ask me anything you'd it's like, Terrence. It's not a personal question to you. It's a personal question from me. How, how do you like having the projection of special identity constantly laid on you? It's a sadhana. It's my practice. That's a good answer. Although you didn't say how you liked it. I like it to the capacity I have to transpose it. If I can't, I mean, sometimes these are going very fast. And to just keep it transposed, then it, I love it. I love it. It's like a fire. If the minute I start to lose it, it's a fucking drag. It really is. Because, I mean, you know, I was in a system, situation in Miami where all these women with blue eyes and coiffured hair were grabbing at the buttons of my jacket. And I thought, oh, I don't want this. Whatever this life is, I don't want to be part of this. I mean, this is, they eat your flesh, finally. Sure. And, but I realized at any time, I can walk away from it. And it's my, you know, I'm, I'm a free agent. So do you never get in a situation where you say, gee, I'd like to do X, but Ram Dass would never do that? My uh, stock and trade, or my coinage, is in sharing just those predicaments publicly. See, I've turned it into, right? You've managed to, but public confession is the subtlest form of wastrelry. Of wastrelry, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do it myself. <laughs> Say, I'm not a good guy, don't follow me, I'm a bad guy. Then I leave the stage and say, now I can really be a bad guy. <laughs> Come up and see my holy pictures. <laughs> That's the one of my lines in my lecture. <laughs> I don't. I'll tell you. You're all. I only see the uh, the stuff that would disturb me is inside myself. It has nothing to do with out there. I out there is just being what it is, and I'm responding with my own stuff. And if my stuff is my enemy, it's going to get too much for me. And if it isn't, you know. Depends on how much I can consume it, joyfully participate in it, passionately, all of it. Well, you've sort of achieved a unique synthesis. I mean, you're almost a secular holy man, because I don't think people, I don't care much about what you believe or who you light candles to. Basically, I think I heard you describe yourself once as a kind man. And you've gotten incredible mm -hmm. mileage out of that because there are so few. It's far out. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is... Well, when you talked about coming back into the boundarylessness, to me, that's the whole quality of compassion, has that boundarylessness to it. It's that your suffering is my suffering, and your joy is my suffering, and you are me, and here we are. And if and you, you hurt, feel I'm it. responding to your hurt, not because I'm a good guy and you're needful, just because here is, this is suffering, and this is the response to suffering, and we're both part of the same thing. And that's the way I like to play it from. That's, to me, it's like riding a wave. It's the joy of just being part of the force of compassion in the universe. See, my mantra is the Gandhi line, my life is my message. That, yes, and you that's said that the other night. That's level very of good. Being, of every level of being. I think I'm at a little lower level because I'm very aware that um, I have to struggle to have my to say my life is my message. I would almost rather say, my message is my message. Please don't look at my life because I'm a fallible human being and I'm constantly but fucking up. you see up. how that weakens your message? You see how that quality has, means that the message doesn't come from the 
the root, the central. It, you're, it, there's a way in which it waffles. True. Because, and that's the thing. I, I really can't. Once I saw the possibility of that, I said, why waffle? What is worth holding on to that's worth waffling about? Well, I once said to Leo Zeff, I'm sure you knew Leo, I said to him in a, in a meeting, uh, I said, Leo, you're, you're finished, you're completed, you're, you're baked. Me, I'm half-baked. <laughs> and I hope that the rest of my life will finish the baking but you don't, process. you're not half-baked. That's what's interesting. I mean, when you and I talk, you and I hear each other perfectly. The truth. And so where are we hearing each other from? I mean, then we each play our game the way we play our game. You know, and you can play your game saying I'm half-baked. That's your strategy if you choose. <laughs> it's a mercurial strategy. <laughs> yes, I understand <laughs> Here's to Mercurius. Hmm. You have somehow been able to survive the gauntlet of American media in a way that your colleagues and comrade in arms didn't seem to. They either had to step away from their leader role or they transmuted it into some lesser thing. So now Allen Ginsberg is poet laureate. Tim Leary is, uh, you know, keeps the club scene in it's Los Angeles interesting. Yes. yes, but you, in a sense, never backed down, never retooled. You were also not first among equals back in the original thing. But when all is said and done, I was always the second. In a way, it's like birds. If you stay just behind the lead bird, you don't have to do much, you know? You're just kind of riding along on the... On the well, and Ralph yeah. tells me to be third is the real good <laughs> position. <laughs> it's like being the young prince. You won't ever be king. It was, actually, it was only until about five years ago that I'd, in the past five years, they've stopped introducing me as Tim Leary's partner. Right. Know? And which, I mean, I think that was great. I see him as one of my, you know, first teachers, great teachers. Uh -huh. And, uh, but I don't have the fun for me. And it says, I have no model of myself. I mean, I don't know who I am. I don't know whether I'm an anachronism from the 60s or I'm a just about to happen. A prophet to be. Yes, I have no idea. And I don't care. That's what I saw. Because either of them, all the things you get in either way are a drag and they're beautiful. Equally. No, well, I think you're a prophet to be. I think we all are. The, you know, we all are. Yes. As Bilbo Baggins once said, the greatest adventure still lies ahead. I believe that. Yeah, I'll believe that too. when they lower my box. I I'll do too. I do too. Exactly. Good. Exactly. Well, thanks yeah. for coming by. I'm sure you had many, many demands on you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. A pleasure. Good. I was afraid of you up until now. Now I'm delighted to no, meet no. you. No, no. Don't be afraid of me. The people who are afraid of me don't know me, or no. they know me better than I you know. ever will. <laughs> <laughs>
across a landscape of energy and matter toward union with this transcendental object. Once I got over here to Honolulu and we were facing these doctors, I, I said to them, I said, you know, if you want to guilt trip me, I have a history of the uh, psychedelic and recreational drugs. And they just waved it away as preposterous and said, no, 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 this comes out of your genetics, this comes out of the environment, this is, this is not about smoking dope in the evening. Um. Well, that just tore another question right out of my hands. And so, so you asked it yourself? Oh, of course, because I knew that anybody hearing this news about me... Was going to say, ah, oh, remember all the drugs he took? Right. Yeah. See what happened to that guy? Here's a, here's a bad example. These, these scientific doctors don't hold out much hope. I mean, I think they're trained to look you right in the eye, and they do, and they say... Six to nine months, no escape, no escape. And, and so that's what they're telling you now? That's what they're telling me now, yeah. I think uh, what we're really talking about here, Art, is uh, the power of love. That's right. And once they pull the rug out from under you and give you a death sentence, suddenly the lights come on and you realize that... Uh, Love is what it's all about, and love is what keeps people going, it cures diseases, it brings children into the world, it makes people able to die with dignity. Do you, uh, what do you believe about us? You know, I, I, I meant to ask you that when I say about us, you know, we are biological, complex organisms, and the big Kona question is whether we are more than just that whether at death there is not an ending but something else uh, a, a new beginning or something a continuation of some sort obviously in your situation you would have been reflecting on this well I think uh, nature doesn't build patterns as complex as ourselves simply to throw them away at the edge of the grave I, I really think that what a lifetime of psychedelic journeying has taught me is consciousness can exist outside of the body. And if it can exist for an hour or six hours, then why would nature throw the beauty of that away? So I, you know, I've, this has been an emotional turmoil for me, but at my best moments, I say, foreknowledge of your own death, if that's what this is, is a kind of enlightenment. And I see my own life and how I gave energy to certain things, not to other things. Uh, it's, a, it's a revelation. I could have treated people better. I could have been more compassionate, more kind, more open to people. You and I have had many a conversation where I was knocking various uh, ideas or systems which I felt were flaky, and maybe I still feel they're flaky, but what I now see behind all that was the intent and the compassion, the desire to make life, whatever it is, an easier journey to whatever it sweeps us toward. When you review your life, Terence, it's been a pretty good one mostly, hasn't it? Oh, it's been a fantastic life. I mean, I've uh, been many times around the world. I've written books. I know everybody, I've eaten in the best restaurants. I am surprised, Art, at how 
I wouldn't say this is easy to take, but if somebody had described this happening to me, I would have assumed that I would just panic and fling my mind away. And instead, there's been a wonderful consolidation and appreciation. And I'm ready for whatever comes down the pike. This has been uh, a long, strange trip, and I want to live, but if that's not in the cards, I want to do a good job with the time left to me and to learn from this experience. As long as we have civilization, we will have psychochemistry from here on out. So it's up to us to manage that. Uh, one way of managing it, I think, is to exhibit enough sense to come in out of the rain. So why don't we? <laughs> Doesn't that seem like a reasonable <laughs> high consciousness move at this point? <laughs> I think this is impossible, Schwann. <laughs> okay. Plants are what we're talking about. And I've, I used to sort of shy away from the word magic, but more and more I come to, I've come to like it because it makes the right people so uptight. And say, so just talk about magic plants. Who's gonna bust you for magic plants? You say, you mean drugs? No, just magic plants. You say, oh, I see, well, you're an airhead, so. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, so what I'm tr talking about this morning is my hope that the awareness of psychedelics as a personal force in each of your lives, I don't think I have to talk to you about that. You're self-selected for being here, and you know that. What I want to talk about is how important it is to re-understand our history, to re-understand that this is us. We didn't get to this place by ourselves. What distinguishes us from the other primates is that we formed a symbiotic relationship with a mystery and the mystery is an intelligence on this planet we can't say how long at least as long as we have been here may have come from the stars could be an extraterrestrial intellect could be the dark recesses of our own mind that we have evolved so far from that we cannot recognize but we might as well treat it like an extraterrestrial because no extraterrestrial that we are going to meet is going to be as alien as this thing that we have found in ourselves. The aliens of Hollywood who come in metallic ships with an interest in our atomic power plants or our redwood trees or whatever are just like the guy living next door compared to the entities that we find in our own mind. So it doesn't do any good to psychologize the alien and say, as Jung attempted to say, well, it's the autonomous other. 
Autonomous psychic components in the human mind present themselves as elves, fairies, sprites, and aliens. Once you've met an elf, a sprite, a fairy, or an alien, you realize that waving the wand that says this is a component of your own psyche is just ludicrous. It's as ludicrous as me waving a wand at you and announcing that that's gotten rid of your existential validity because you're a part of my own psyche. You know, it's uh, madness when applied to another person, and I think it's equally appropriate when applied to uh, to these entities contacted in the trance. To do that, to try to reduce it, to say, well, it's just the one part of my head talking to another, is to fall into this paternalistic scientific desire to have it all be very neat. How would it be if it's not neat at all? How would it be if nobody really knows what's going on? How would it be if understanding what reality is actually depended for you upon you? And that book by Fritz of Capra that you paid $18.95 for isn't going to do it. And neither is sitting at the feet of some guru that it's serious business. And the first thing to understand is that nobody knows that, that you're not looking for a teacher. It hasn't been found out. It's not sitting on the shelf of some library. It is being figured out now and your job is to die with the state of the art understanding having emerged into your mind five minutes before you got there and then you know that will carry you through we need to awaken to the adventure and the richness and the openness of the game the rules have not yet been forged we will forge the rules ourselves, each for ourselves and each for the rest of us by working forward through this thing. Uh, I think we're at the very beginnings of grappling and dealing with the psychedelic era. We are like people talking about evolution in 1855. You know, a few of us have read Darwin's paper. Nobody's sure exactly what it means. It's a strong intuition of something. The species thing is a problem. Nobody's quite sure. Uh, there's uh, a new model of life and culture ahead of us, and it comes out of exploring with each other the places we have been by ourselves, the places that we have gone and been taken by the Spirit. Take it easy, dude, <laughs> but take it. And it's the heart of it that is so hard to talk about. I mean, I skim the ideas off the depth of a sea of heart whose boundaries cannot be taken, because that's my style. But the unsaid part, the dizziness of the things unsaid, remember the poem by Trumbull Stickney, I lean over your meaning's edge and I feel the dizziness of the things you have not said. And the dizziness of the things unsaid, for us fans of dizziness, is ecstasy. The vertigo, weren't we first spun in the schoolyard? Wasn't that your first altered state of consciousness? To be spun and spun until you fall down and watch the world move around? It's the dizziness of the things unsaid. That's a real problem for me, I'm a sayer. But uh, it's worth invoking it, uh, if only to let it resonate in the silence.
So that's the end of my song.